A very good evening aspirants. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I have an important announcement for you to know. It is about our pre storming test series which is going to start on March 5th. A total number of 25 tests will be covered under this test series and to know more about our test series, you can check the description in this video. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Today's date is 2nd of March 2023, displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. The land owners of Section 8B in Northwest Delhi have formed a consortium. Consortium is an agreement where a group of people have agreed together to work on a particular project. Okay. Now the land owners of Section 8B have formed a consortium under the Delhi Development Authority's land pooling policy. The formation of this consortium will make the section eligible for development works. Now the thing here is we cannot just simply form a consortium without any condition. At least 70% of landowners have to agree to pool in their land and 70% of the land should be next to each other. Only then they can form a consortium and according to the land pooling policy, 40% of the pooled land will be surrendered to the Delhi Development Authority for public infrastructure works. Now know that the urban local body in Delhi will be playing the role of facilitator in the land pooling policy. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about what is this land pooling and some of the benefits associated with it. First, let's start with land pooling. See, land pooling refers to an activity where a group of land owners have come together and they agree to hand over their land parcels to the government collectively. Now, this does not mean that the landowners are selling their land to the government. Here, they only agree to provide their land temporarily for developmental processes. So, we can say that the ownership of the land remains with the original landholder. So, once the land gets developed by the government, then it will be redistributed to the landowners itself. Now, the idea behind the policy of land pooling is to aggregate small parcels of land into a large parcel make note of this point now this is done mainly to develop necessary infrastructure like water supply drainage system then to make provisions for large social infrastructure including metros and roads and remember for carrying out the land pooling process a land pooling agency will be constituted by the government now this land pooling agency only after the development of the land will redistribute the land to the respective owners while redistributing, they will also detect some portion as compensation towards infrastructure cost. So this is all about land pooling. Now knowing about this technique is very important because most of the land has been fragmented now and about 85% of small and marginal farmers are there in India. Development process can be done only if the land parcels are large enough. Okay. So in such scenario, land pooling is a very good idea to bring together all the small and marginal lands together for developmental purposes. Okay. Now here you might have a doubt how it is different from land acquisition. See just now we saw that land pooling refers to an activity where a group of landowners will hand over their land temporarily to the government for developmental purposes. But when it comes to land acquisition, it refers to the acquisition of private land by the government. This means that the ownership of the land is transferred to the government. So the private land owners cannot get back their land unlike land pooling. Okay. But here the similarity between both land pooling and land acquisition is that both are done for the purpose of public infrastructure development like roads, metros and etc. Okay. Now let us see some of the benefits of land pooling. See the primary benefit of land pooling policy is that the ownership remains with the original landholder. So it reduces the chances of legal disputes and compensation disbursements. Apart from this land pooling policy will also promote collaboration. So there are more chances for public private partnership in the developmental process. So that's all regarding this news article. In this news article we saw about a concept called land pooling. Land pooling refers to an activity where a group of landowners have come together and they agree to hand over their land parcel to the government collectively. 
once the land gets developed by the government then it will be redistributed to the land owners after detecting some portion as compensation towards infrastructure cost now land pooling is different from land acquisition in land acquisition the land does not come back but the similarity is both are done for the purpose of public infrastructure development like roads metros etc so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion have a look at the small article from the text and context page the article is that according to the recent report from the international atomic energy agency iaea iran's fordo nuclear site is having about 83.7 percentage of enriched uranium particles as we all know iran signed a nuclear deal in 2015 with p5 countries this deal limited iran's uranium stockpile to 300 kilograms and uranium enrichment to 3.7 percentage but as per the recent iaea report uranium enrichment in iran stood at 83.7 percentage so as per the article this violation in enrichment would create tensions between iran and the west so this is the crux of the news article given here so what does this term uranium enrichment mean let us understand that in this news article discussion firstly let us see few facts about uranium see uranium is a silvery white metallic chemical element with symbol u and atomic number 92 uranium has the highest atomic weight of all naturally occurring elements remember there are three isotopes of uranium which occur naturally isotopes or nothing but distinct nuclear species of the same element okay such three types of uranium or uranium 238 uranium 235 and uranium 234 see across the world the majority of the nuclear power reactors use uranium 235 isotope as a fuel this is because uranium 235 is the only naturally occurring isotope of uranium that undergoes nuclear fission a nuclear fission is a reaction in which the nucleus of an atom splits into two or more smaller nuclei this fission reaction produces radiation and enormous amount of heat so in nuclear power plants the heat produced by nuclear fission is used to generate electricity now talking about the enrichment process see as i said earlier the majority of the nuclear power reactors use uranium 235 isotope as a fuel however u235 only makes up 0.7 percentage of the mined natural uranium so to create an effective nuclear fuel out of mined uranium the concentration of u235 must be increased through a process called enrichment this enrichment process helps to increase the concentration of uranium 235 from 0.7 percentage to between 3 percentage and 5 percentage this 3 to 5 percentage is the level which is used in most nuclear reactors to produce electricity now the problem lies here if the uranium 235 is enriched beyond 5 percentage it becomes the fuel for nuclear weapons the news article today says that iran's fordo nuclear site is having about 83.7 percentage enriched uranium particles hope you can get the point so this variation in enrichment is creating tension between iran and the west now if you are asking me how this enrichment process takes place see the enrichment process requires the uranium to be in a gaseous form this gaseous form of uranium can be achieved through a process called conversion through the conversion process uranium oxide which is a powdered form of mined and powdered uranium is converted into a different compound called uranium hexafluoride this uranium hexafluoride is a gas at relatively low temperatures so after this process the uranium hexafluoride is fed into centrifuges now look at this image given here these are the centrifuges which have thousands of rapidly spinning vertical tubes the centrifuges separate the uranium hexafluoride into two streams one stream contains enriched uranium 235 and the other stream contains lower concentration of uranium 235 so this is how uranium 235 is enriched okay so in this news article discussion we saw in detail about uranium how it is used as an effective nuclear fuel and we saw about the enrichment process so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it talks about social stock exchanges sse 
Now this is a news because the market regulator Securities and Exchange Board of India SEBI has given its final approval to the National Stock Exchange of India NSE to launch its social stock exchange as a separate segment. This article basically suggests that when capital market are combined with social welfare then it would help the non-profit organizations to raise funds and function properly. So in this discussion we will try to understand about social stock exchange and its functioning. This topic falls under these parts of the syllabus. Kindly go through it. First of all, what is Social Stock Exchange, SSE? See, we all know how stock exchange works, right? Basically, a stock exchange acts as a facilitator to connect various market participants. Here, a public limited company lists their shares. And there would be buyers who are interested in purchasing them. For example, if I buy shares of XY company, I will be a shareholder in the company. So when the company makes profit, I will get a share in the profit proportionate to the amount of share I hold there. So now I also benefit because of the returns I get and the company also benefits because it gets funds to run the business. So this is how any stock exchange function. Now these SSEs are not very different from this. The only difference is that the companies which raise funds through this platform are social enterprises like non-profit organization and for-profit social enterprises. So technically a social stock exchange is a platform that will help social enterprises to raise funds from the public. It is similar to a stock exchange which helps companies raise funds from the public. So now what are the eligibility criteria? See as I told earlier, the NSE has come up with a separate social stock exchange. So in this exchange, any social enterprise, be it a non-profit organization or for-profit social enterprise, they can get registered and listed. But this organization must have established its priority towards social objectives. Remember, there are 17 criteria listed under Regulation 292E of SEBI's ICDR, that is Issue of Capital and Disclosure Requirements Regulation 2018. It says that enterprises must be serving to eradicate either hunger, poverty, malnutrition and inequality. Or it could be serving to promote education, employment, equality, empowerment of women and LGBTQIA plus communities. Further organization working towards environmental sustainability, protection of national heritage and art or bridging the digital divide can also be listed. One more condition is that at least 67% of their activities must be directed towards attaining the stated objective. So if you are asking me how can social enterprises raise fund on social stock exchange, See, firstly, a non-profit organization will have to register itself on the social stock exchange. Then it can start to raise fund by issuing financial instruments like zero coupon, zero principle. We'll see about zero coupon, zero principle, is it C, is it P in a while. As of now, know that it is an instrument used by social enterprises to raise fund. Now, it is a little different for for-profit enterprises. The for-profit enterprises need not register with social stock exchanges before it raises fund. However, it must comply with all provisions of ICDR regulations when raising funds through the SSE. It can raise money through issue of equity shares on main board, SME platform or innovators growth platform or it can issue equity shares to an alternative investment fund including social impact fund. So now we'll see about this zero coupon zero principle instrument. See normally if any entity wants to take a loan they will issue a regular debt security. Now the entity has to make interest payments and then return the principal when the bond matures. But with this new financial instrument that is ZC ZP an entity issues securities and raises money. But it is not a loan it is a donation. So the entity in our case the social enterprise does not have to pay interest so we call it as zero coupon and it does not have to pay the principal amount either so zero principal. 
so a non profit organization can issue a zero coupon zero principal security through a social stock exchange and those who are willing to donate money to this npo can buy these securities now here you might wonder why should anyone donate in this complicated manner you can easily go to the nearest social enterprise that you have admiration for you can write a check or make an online transfer you can then collect the receipt and submit it for tax detection why to buy securities and make the process so complicated see it is about the transparency this new tool will give you more insight into how your donation will be used see there have always been concerns about a lack of transparency in the way donations are used by the social enterprises to bring in transparency we have a catch in the ssc mechanism the organizations listed on ssc have to do regular audit of social impact and these will be disclosed to all stakeholders sebi's regulations state that a social enterprise should submit an annual impact report in a prescribed format the report must be audited by a social audit firm and has to be submitted within 90 days from the end of the financial year so this is the checkpoint here so that is all you have to know about from this news article discussion in this news article discussion we came to know about a new mechanism called social stock exchange so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion see this data point is based on an analysis that was published in the lancet magazine the analysis concluded that india is not on target to achieve 19 of the 33 sustainable development goals indicators that is if the current trend continues india will not be able to achieve 19 of the 33 sustainable development goals indicators so this is the crux of the data point given here so in our discussion today we will focus on sdg and the contents of this data point in detail before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it so let's start with sdgs the sustainable development goals are also known as the global goals sdgs came into existence at the united nations conference on sustainable development in rio de janeiro in 2012 the objective of the sdgs is to produce a set of global goals that will help humanity address the urgent environmental political and economic challenges facing our world the sdgs were adopted by all united nation member states in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty protect the planet and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030 okay now remember the sdgs replaced the millennium development goals mdgs which started in 2000 the mdgs established measurable universally agreed objectives for tackling extreme poverty and hunger preventing deadly diseases and expanding primary education to all children among other development priorities The main difference between MDG and SDG is that unlike the MDGs which only targets the developing countries the SDGs apply to all countries whether rich middle or poor countries the SDGs are also nationally owned and country led wherein each country is given the freedom to establish a national framework in achieving the SDGs remember united nations sdgs have 17 goals 169 targets and 306 national indicators they are well integrated goals meaning action in one area will affect outcome in others and it also means that development must balance social economic and environmental sustainability all the united nation member countries have also pledged to leave no one behind that means the member countries have committed to fast track progress in these goals for the farthest behind first means taking explicit action to end the extreme and that is why the sdgs are designed to bring the world to several life changing zeros like zero poverty hunger aids and discrimination against women and girls So with this basic understanding about SDG now let us see about the contents of the article see in the analysis published in the Lancet magazine 33 SDG indicators were used to assess 9 of the 17 official SDGs and as i already mentioned at the beginning of the discussion india is not on target to achieve 19 of the 33 sustainable development goals indicators 
seven not seven districts were surveyed as part of the analysis, and seventy five percentage of the districts were off the target. And these off target districts are concentrated in the states of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Bihar, and Odisha. In this graph, the dark blue represents the number of districts that have already met the SDG target by 2021. In indicators like adolescent pregnancy, tobacco use in women, multi-dimensional poverty, teenage sexual violence, and electricity access, many of the analyzed districts have met their 2030 targets by 2021 itself. Now look at this graph. Here, the light blue color represent the districts that are on the track to achieve the SDG targets by 2030. Indicators with the most districts on target are internet use, improved sanitation, birth registration, full vaccination, and skilled birth attendance. Now finally, look at this graph. Here, the grayish blue represent the districts that are off target. That is, these indicators, many district in India will fail to reach the SDG targets by 2030. What is worrying in the published analysis is that many districts that are off target would find it very difficult to meet the target. Now look at this graph. This graph shows when the off target district will finally reach the target. Here, the dark red bar represents the districts that will never meet the target. In indicators like anemia, wasting, partner violence, and stunting, many off-target districts will not be able to reach the SDG even after 2041. So the government must heavily invest in social security so that the human capital of India can be augmented and our demographic dividend can be utilized. Now you can make note of all these data and use it in your main answer. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this editorial article. It talks about the heat wave which swept across northern part of India last month. See normally heat waves don't occur in the month of February because it comes under the winter months category. So the heat waves which occurred last month in northern India is a rare case. The article by stating this fact wants the Indian government to be more prepared in tackling the heat waves which are going to impact the summer months later this year. So this is what is given in the news article. In this context let us learn few points mentioned in the article. Before that the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Now let us see about what happened in North India last month. See some parts of India not only received heat wave spells last month but the average temperature of these spaces have also seen an increase. Indian Meteorological Department has termed the February 2023 as the warmest February month since the year 1901. You know that average temperature of February which is a winter month is usually around low 20s. But this has considerably changed this month. Also IMD in its last assessment has said that these trends are likely to spill over into the upcoming summer months see normally heat waves are declared when maximum temperature of a particular region increases over 45 degree celsius or if the temperatures are 4.5 degree celsius over what is the normal temperature for the region if any one of the above two conditions are satisfied then heat wave can be declared in an area Now when we see the climate change studies conducted recently they talk about the increased instance of heat waves occurring in India take for example the recently concluded Lancet study it reported that there would be a 55 percentage rise in death due to extreme temperature as a result of heat waves it also reported that excessive heat could also lead to a loss of 167.2 billion potential labor hours among indians This Lancet study shows the impact of heat waves on India. Also know that Pacific Ocean has witnessed a triple dip La Nina for the past 3 years. Due to the continued presence of La Nina over the Pacific Ocean for the past 3 years, there is a huge accumulation of warm water over the coast of eastern Australia. Because of this accumulation of warm water in western Pacific, there is a huge chance that this year would be an El Nino year. If El Nino phenomena occurs in Pacific Ocean later this year, it would have a profound effect on the monsoon season in India. 
other than this el nino also causes a slight increase in the number of heat waves occurring in india but here whether the el nino phenomenon will occur or not will only be ascertained after the month of march this is because data from the global forecast models regarding the sea surface temperatures of pacific ocean will be available only after the march month the editorial also says that linking the instances of increased heat waves with climate change needs to be done only with the backing of science now coming to the preventive measures which need to be taken to deal with heat waves see firstly public health systems in india need to be upgraded to deal with increased number of cases caused due to heat waves here state specific action plan can be brought forward to deal with the heat waves hospitals in rural areas should also be equipped with basic facilities to deal with individuals affected by heat waves secondly climate resilient crop varieties needed to be introduced to tide over potential heat wave in the future crops which mature early can also be made part of the agricultural system other than this water management practices should also be changed to factor in increased case of heat waves so these are all some of the mechanisms which can be introduced by the indian government to keep a check on the effect of heat waves so with this we came to the end of this discussion through this discussion we came to know about the presumed effect of heat waves in india also we saw about few mechanisms which can be brought to reduce the impact of heat waves on the population so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article reports that the urban home ministry has suspended the foreign contribution regulation act registration of the center for public policy research cpr for 180 days know that cpr is a delhi based think tank which was founded in 1973 it is a non profit non partition independent institution dedicated to conducting research during last september cpr's office was surveyed by the income tax department later the it department found that the cpr had violated fcra provisions this is why the home ministry has suspended the fcra registration of the cpr for 180 days know that fcra registration is mandatory to receive foreign funds due to suspension of fcra registration now cpr will not be able to receive any fresh foreign donation or utilize the existing foreign donations without the home ministry's clearance this is what given in the news article so in this discussion we will learn some points about foreign contribution regulation act fcra 2010 See, the main objective behind the creation of FCRA is to consolidate the laws that regulate the acceptance and utilization of foreign contribution by certain individuals or associations or companies. FCRA basically aims to prohibit acceptance and utilization of foreign contributions for any activities which are detrimental to national interest. Now talking about the jurisdiction of FCRA see the provisions of FCRA shall apply to whole of India then the citizen of India who is residing outside India and the associate branches and subsidiaries of Indian companies or Indian corporate bodies present outside India now moving on to see what is foreign contribution according to FCRA 2010 See foreign contribution according to the act means the donation delivery or transfer made by any foreign resource it may be in the form of any article any currency whether indian or foreign any security as defined in the securities contracts regulation act 1956 and any foreign security as defined in the foreign exchange management act 1999 now we'll see who can receive foreign contribution see an individual or a hindu undivided family or an association or a company registered under the companies act 2013 can receive foreign contribution but it is subjected to three conditions firstly the receiver must have a definite cultural economic educational religious or social program secondly the receiver must obtain the fcra registration or prior permission from the central government and the last condition is that the receiver must not be prohibited under section 3 of fcra 
Note that all the applications for registration under this act or its further renewal should be made only through online mode. So this is all you have to know about FCRA Act 2010. Very important article. There might be a prelims question in this regard. So make note of all the points discussed. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. According to this news article, our Prime Minister has mentioned that with India fast urbanizing, there is a need to build new cities and also steps must be taken to modernize the old cities. He also mentioned the 15,000 crore rupees has been allocated as part of this year's budget for planned and systematic urbanization in the country. So in this context, let us see few facts about the schemes or programs launched by the government to aid urban development. See the first scheme that we are going to see is the Smart City Mission. It is an initiative of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Through this mission, the government aims to provide core infrastructure to the cities. By addressing the infrastructure gap in the cities, the government aims to increase the standard of living of the citizens. Also note that this is a centrally sponsored scheme. The next scheme that we are going to see is the Amrut Mission. Here Amrut stands for Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation. This mission is also the initiative of Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Through this mission, the government aims to provide basic services to households and build amenities in cities. This will help improve the quality of life for all, especially the poor and the disadvantaged. The main focus area of this mission are water supply, sewage and septage management, storm water drainage to reduce flooding, non-motorized urban transport, green space or parks. Like the smart city mission, this is also a centrally sponsored scheme. The next scheme is the Swachh Bharat Urban Mission. This mission also comes under the aegis of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. The mission has three objectives. The first one is the eradication of open defecation in all statutory towns. The second objective is the 100% scientific management of municipal solid waste in all statutory towns. And the last one is to bring about behavioral change. The next scheme is the Hridai scheme. Here Hridai stands for Heritage City Development and Augmentation Yojana. India is endowed with rich and diverse natural, historic and cultural resources. We know that right. However, it is yet to explore the full potential of such resources to its full advantages. To help the heritage cities reach their full potential, the Hridai scheme was launched. This scheme also comes under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, but this is a central sector scheme. The main objective of Hridai is to preserve the character of the soul of heritage city and facilitate inclusive heritage linked urban development. Focus under this scheme is mainly provided to sanitation, security, tourism, heritage, revitalization and retaining the city's cultural identity. The last scheme that we are going to see today is the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Urban. Like all the scheme that we discussed today, this scheme also comes under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and it is centrally sponsored scheme. The scheme aims to address the housing shortage among the urban poor. The scheme promotes women empowerment by providing the ownership of houses in the name of female members or in joint names. The houses built under this scheme will have basic amenities like toilets, water supply, electricity and kitchen. Also preference will be given to differently abled persons, senior citizens, SCs, STs, OBCs, minority, single women, transgender and other weaker and vulnerable section of the society. So this is all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion we saw five different schemes or programs of government to aid urban development. We saw about smart city mission, Amrut mission, Swachh Bharat urban mission, Hridai scheme and we saw about Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Urban. So with these learned points, now let us move to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. It says that the single window clearance and monitoring authority of Himachal Pradesh has approved 34 projects for setting up new enterprises and for expansion of existing enterprises. In this context, let us learn about the single window clearance for coal. So what is the single window clearance portal? 
See, commercial coal blocks are auctioned through online bidding process. Those who quote competitive prices and have necessary technical skills come out as successful bidders. But now they need clearance for operating the coal mine. Such clearances include mining plan and mine closure plan, then grant of mining lease, environment and forest clearance, wildlife clearance, safety, then rehabilitation of project affected families, then welfare of workers. Likewise, there are 19 such clearances. Bidders have to obtain all required clearances. And these are prerequisites for starting a coal mine. So, for getting these clearances, a single window clearance portal was created. It allows the successful bidders to obtain all required clearance from a single portal instead of having to go to multiple authorities. So, we can say this as an example for e-governance. So, what are the significance of having a single window clearance system? See, now the bidders will be able to operationalize the coal mines quickly without much delay. This is good because previously coal blocks which were auctioned off usually take more than 2 to 3 years to get operationalized. Then it is in the spirit of minimum government and maximum governance. Thirdly, it will further ease of doing business in the coal sector in India. And finally, it will help in bringing huge investment and creating more employment opportunities. So that's all regarding this news article. In this news article, we saw about single window clearance portal. Along with that, we also saw some of the significance of having a single window clearance system. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the practice prelims questions. Now look at this first question. This question is about a scheme, Swanidhi. Statement 1 says it was launched by Ministry of Finance. See, this statement is actually incorrect because it was launched by Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Second statement says that through this scheme, the government provides affordable working capital loan to street vendors to resume their livelihood that have been adversely affected due to COVID-19 lockdown. See, actually this statement is correct. This statement is the exact vision of the scheme. And the third statement says that Small Industries Development Bank of India is the technical partner for implementation of the scheme. This statement is also correct. The Small Industries Development Bank of India is the technical partner for implementation of the scheme. Remember, this scheme covers street vendors belonging to the urban, peri-urban and rural areas as well. Okay. So, the correct answer for this question is option B213 only because the first statement is incorrect. Now, moving on to the second question. This question is about... FCRA statement 1 says this act is not applicable to the Indian citizens who are residing outside India. Actually, this statement is incorrect. We saw that in the discussion itself, right? FCRA is applicable to the citizens of India even though they are residing outside India. Now, look at the second statement. As per the act, a company registered under the Companies Act 2013 can receive foreign contribution. See, this statement is correct. A company which is registered under Companies Act 2013 can receive foreign contribution. So the correct answer for the question is option B2 only. Now moving on, this question is about single window clearance. Statement 1 says, in India, state governments do not have the power to auction non-coal mines. See, this statement is actually incorrect. State governments have the power to auction non-coal mines as well. Now the second statement says, Andhra Pradesh and Jharkhand do not have gold mines. This statement is also again incorrect. Jharkhand and Andhra Pradesh have two of the three active coal mines in India. Now the third statement says Rajasthan has iron ore mines. This statement is actually correct. Bilwara in Rajasthan has an iron ore mine. So the correct answer for this question is option D3 only because both the statement 1 and 2 are incorrect. Now moving on. This question is about International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. Statement 1 says it is an intergovernmental organization that seeks to promote peaceful use of nuclear energy. See, this statement is actually correct. It is an intergovernmental organization and it seeks to promote the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The agency also prevents the use of nuclear energy for any military purpose, including nuclear weapons. Now look at the second statement. The agency is not a part of United Nations system. This statement is incorrect. The IAEA is an autonomous international organization but within the United Nations system. 
So the statement is incorrect. Statement 3 says that India became a member of this agency after the 1998 Pokhran 2 nuclear test. This statement is absolutely wrong. We know that India became a member of IAEA in 1957 itself. Since statement 2 and 3 are incorrect and the question here asks for the incorrect statement, the correct answer here is option B 2 and 3 only because first statement is correct. Okay. Now moving on, the question displayed here is the prelims quiz question for you today. Just go through the question, try to answer it in the comment section. Dear aspirants, the questions displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today. Just go through the questions, try to write an answer and post it in the comment section. So with this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. A lot of people are watching our video but they are not subscribing our video. So please do subscribe us and support us. Thank you for listening.